Okay, just before we get started, I want to remind everyone that the examination is tomorrow. There's an announcement and an email about the times. I expect the times and the method of delivery of the exam to be exactly the same as it was for you in the previous exam. Still on a Thursday, still starting at the same times, still delivering the three parts of the exam, excuse me, of the exam separately. If for some reason that doesn't work for you, you need to let me know today, okay? So we can set everything up just because uh, it can be a little tricky setting up the times and stuff on my courses. And I'm going to go through and do that today. Um, but I assume that everyone is okay with the, um, with the same times that they had last time. If not, send me an email. Um, the exam will not cover what we're going to talk about today. But it still does talk about Rankin cycles in their kind of most basic form. And today we're still talking about Rankin cycles, but in their kind of most complicated form. So just a reminder, what's on the second exam is we started off looking at open systems, right? How to use the open version of the first law, how to use conservation of mass. Then we talked a little bit about the open version of the second law, right? Trying to solve for sigma or sigma dot. Then we talked about kind of big cycle analysis for Carnot cycles, right? So basically you can look at the whole cycle and you can say that the thermal efficiency is network over heat in, but if it's a Carnot cycle, that's going to equal one minus T cold over T hot, right? We got to remember that those temperatures are in Kelvin or Rankin and not in Celsius or Fahrenheit. Um, and then finally, we started to put everything together into cycles, right? So we started on Rankin cycles and the stuff that's going to be available for this first exam to test you on is a four component Rankin cycle. So you'll need to know how to do a Rankin cycle that has a turbine, a condenser, a pump, and a boiler, right? Or a steam generator, depending on the terminology that you prefer. I think the textbook talks about um, a boiler only goes to saturated vapor and a steam generator takes you into the superheated vapor region. But I tend to use those two terms interchangeably. So that's what's going to be on the exam for next class. Um, so the exam is tomorrow evening, but next class we will have uh, just an open period. So if you have questions about any of the material on the exam, or you'd like me to go through some examples for things, uh, please bring your questions. I won't have anything prepared, um, but I, like I said, free, feel free to bring in your questions and I'm happy to help. Any questions about the exam before we get started? All right, so today we're going to talk about kind of the final piece of the puzzle for how do we get more efficient, right? So we talked about, oh, we can increase T hot, we can decrease T cold, we can add another turbine with heating in between, we call that a reheat cycle. And today we're gonna to talk about regenerative Rankin cycles, or we're gonna add this new strategy called regeneration. In a lot of ways, I think, well, I guess in one particular way, this is maybe the most difficult thing on the exam. I think Rankin cycle on the, for the final exam, I think Rankin cycles with regeneration, they've got a wrinkle that makes them at least in a way harder than all the other cycles that we'll do. And that's that for this cycle, not every component has one inlet and one outlet. But let's go back to the beginning. When we're talking about a Rankin cycle, we're still talking about a heat engine. No matter how many sort of bells and whistles we put on our Rankine cycle, it's a heat engine, right? And if we're trying to characterize that heat engine, we talk about the thermal efficiency. This is different than an isentropic efficiency for a turbine or a pump. This is the efficiency of the whole cycle, right? So a heat engine, what we're trying to do is we're putting in heat, that's the energy cost, and we're getting out work, that's the energy benefit. So our thermal efficiency is net work over heat in, but net work is equal to, if we take just the magnitudes here, the heat in minus the heat out. Or if you prefer to get these terms from the first law, it would be heat in plus heat out, 
you just got to make sure that your net heat is equal to your net work and that your net heat is not larger than your heat in. So because this is a, um, or a heat engine, right, we can look at this equation. And this equation, like we said, I mean, it's a pretty simple equation, right? There's two terms, right? Net work, heat in. I think about reheat as increasing our heat in or increasing our net work because we're adding that extra term. Now, obviously, both of these cycles are improving the thermal efficiency. So what that means is that the rate, the, the work rate or the power is increasing faster than the heat rate in, right? But I think about increasing the work as reheat because we add another turbine. And then I think about decreasing the heat that goes in as regeneration. And that's what we're going to talk about today, right? So hopefully you'll see why I think about this as reducing the heat that we have to put into the cycle. So this is at least one type of regeneration system. Now, before we talk about regenerative systems, I want to tell you a story about a house that we had built before I, when I still lived in Canada, right? So I lived in what was the fastest growing uh, city in all of Canada before we moved here. Basically, it was the furthest away you could get from Toronto, right? But you could still take the commuter train in. So, you know, it was somewhat affordable to live there. And, and you know, building construction there was, um, you know, like basically every winter we'd go into our house, right? You don't go outside as much during the winter. You come out and there'd be like whole new subdivisions all over the place, right? But because these were new homes, you know, they focused on being energy efficient. And one of the things that they did was they said, okay, let's say it's, well, it's summertime today, right? So, so you know, yesterday I think the temperature was probably something around 90. I th still think it's Celsius. So it was like 30 something yesterday. And, um, you know, but I'm paying to, to air condition my house, right? So what my old house used to do, because it, to be like an energy star home, they have to seal it up really well, right? So most houses breathe because they're like not as airtight as maybe you'd like them to be, right? But these energy star homes are sealed up really well, right? So what you do is you have to, you know, get rid of the stale air in your house and bring in the fresh air from outside, right? But the problem is I already paid to cool down the air that's in my house, right? And it's like super hot outside. So they have this heat exchanger where the cool air inside my house is moving in one tube and the hot air coming from the outside is moving in another tube. And what happens is, even though I'm kind of exhausting this cold air out to the environment, it passes by the hot air through this heat exchanger so that that hot air coming in gets cooled down a little bit before it comes into the house, right? And that means that I pay a little bit less to cool that down. Right now, the, you know, the same thing happens in the wintertime where the air inside the house is hot and it leaves the house and it preheats the air that comes into the house. And that means that my furnace is running less. Right? And this is kind of the same um, idea that's behind these regeneration cycles. So just like a reheat cycle, we have two turbines here. Right? But unlike a reheat cycle, we don't go back and heat up the fluid in between these two turbines. Because what we're trying to do, right, is we're trying to preheat the fluid before it gets to the steam generator or the boiler. Right? So we take some mass out of here, right? So we divert some of the flow, some mass fraction Y, which is typically you know, maybe it's like 10 or 15 or 20% of the mass flow rate. So it's some of the mass flow rate, but less than, you know, half even, right? Um, and then the rest goes through this second turbine, one minus Y times the mass flow rate goes over here. So we're still getting power out of the turbine, but not as much power as we would otherwise, right? But the benefit here is we take this hot fluid, which we wouldn't have got as much out of as when it first came into the high pressure turbine, right? And we bring it over here, right? Into what we're calling this open feed water heater, right? Now the rest of the mass, it goes through, it condenses, now it's liquid, but in this open feed water heater, it mixes with this hot stuff that came out of the turbine, 
So that means, you know, if I've got cold water and hot water coming into the feed water heater, I've got some warm water coming out, right? And then we get back up to this high pressure going into the steam generator. And what happens is because of that, right, we've like preheated this fluid that goes into the steam generator, right? So we didn't have to cool that fluid down only to heat it back up. We used it to you know, increase the heat going into the steam generator so we're sort of burning less coal or adding less heat over here. Now, it's important to realize that this is not something that we get for free. This is like, um, you know, in the before times, I would run in these, um, probably sometime right around now, there would be uh, this, Chase Bank does this thing called the Corporate Challenge, right? And it's like a it's a kind of a stupid distance. It's three and a half miles, right? Which is like, I don't know, it's something like 5.6 or 5.8 kilometers, right? So it's this really weird thing, but it's kind of cool because all kind of companies in the Rochester area, and then they have this same things going on in different cities, you go and run, right? So there's, there's like thousands of people there. So it's kind of a cool thing. You feel like you're in this big race, right? But, um, you know, you get a t-shirt right? And you feel like, oh, it's a free t-shirt, right? But I paid a registration fee, right? So that registration fee goes towards buying that t-shirt, right? So here, yeah, we're preheating this fluid before it goes into the steam generator, but we're not getting that heat for free. We're just using heat that we've already paid for. It's just, this is fluid that we're not cooling down only to heat back up, right? So even though what happens here is that we drop the net power, versus, you know, kind of a traditional Rankine cycle that was operating between, between the same temperature points. But what happens is we reduce the heat that we're putting in faster than we're reducing the net power so that our thermal efficiency goes up, All right? So what we do in this, so this is another thing, you know, I've said this a couple of times, I'm a big fan of bringing colored pencils into an exam. Because if you get a problem like this, I think it's very helpful to color code what, what the mass flow rate is in different places. Because unlike all the other cycles we're gonna do, here we split the mass. And because we split the mass, that means that it's not the same mass flow rate everywhere. So we take Y percentage, that's just for argument's sake, I'll call this 20%. So if I take 20% of the mass flow rate in between the two turbines, then what happens is 80% of the mass flow rate goes through this second turbine, then the condenser, then this pump, right? And then the band all gets back together over here in the open feed water heater. So we got a, a hot stream and a cold stream coming in. So then we're gonna have all of the mass flow rate, right? The total mass flow rate move through the rest of the cycle. So move through the pump, the steam generator and the turbine. So there are some tricky things here, right? So first you gotta remember that the mass flow rate is different. Second, sometimes when we talk about a state, it can be associated with either one of the mass flow rates. So I'm gonna have, say 20% of this mass flow rate at state two go into this open feed water heater. And then 80% of the mass flow rate, which is also at state two, go through this second turbine. So it's important here to realize that the states, the mass flow rates don't go with the states, right? The mass flow rates go with the inlets and or the outlets on the different components, right? So this is one version of what a reheat cycle could look like, right? So, um, so this is what uh, the textbook calls an open feed water heater regeneration cycle because it's sort of characterized by what this open feed water heater looks like, right? So the thing about these regeneration cycles is that you know, we're still gonna look at each individual component. We're still gonna do conservation of mass. We're still gonna do the first law. If somebody asks us if it's possible, we're still gonna do the second law. All that stuff looks the same. The tricky part is um, we need to figure out what the mass flow rates are because the mass flow rates won't be constant. All right, so this process, it increases the heat, the, the thermal efficiency because it reduces the heat that's required from the boiler. Right, so we can run this cycle with less heat. Right? The textbook talks about this increasing the average temperature of heat addition. The other thing, remember we talked about one of the things that, that we dislike about Rankine cycles 
is how Calvin and Planck told us, yeah, you can run a heat engine, but you need to reject heat. And basically any heat that we reject is heat that we're not turning into work, right? So here, because we're rejecting less heat, because we're not cooling down as much mass flow, right? Then that means we're kind of quote unquote wasting less heat, right? Which means we're increasing our thermal efficiency, right? So this is kind of Lorax approved, this particular cycle, right? We wouldn't be learning about it if it wasn't practically beneficial. Now, in real life, in real plants, you know, they're making use of all of these things. They're doing, you know, they're increasing the hot temperature, they're decreasing the cold temperature by lowering the pressure uh, out the condenser. And then, you know, they do regeneration and they do reheat and they do all of these things together and they're very complicated, right? But we still want to learn sort of how to go through and do these particular cycles. So there's two different ways that you can set up regeneration in a Rankine cycle, and you could get either or both in a real cycle, right? So we talked about it's classified kind of by the type of regenerative heater, right? So we talked about this open feed water heater, right? Here we're mixing the mass, right? So we take the hot mass from in between these two turbines and we mix it with the cold mass that went through the second turbine and they mix together in the feed water heater and then they come out over here. But I could set up a system where they don't mix, right? So I still take mass, hot mass from in between the two turbines and then have this closed feed water heater where the hot mass runs over something like a radiator, right? And the cold mass that went through the condenser comes back, you know, goes in tubes over here, but they don't actually mix together. This is not like my grandfather's sink when he was shaving, right? With the two things. This is like, uh, like the radiator in your car where one flow is moving over another flow, but they don't actually mix, but they do transfer heat, right? So in the open feed water heater, all the fluid comes back together inside the feed water heater, but in a closed regenerative system, the mass comes back together in the condenser, but we're still gonna use the same kind of strategies, right? So again, a big fan of colored pencils, right? So here we're gonna say, where does the diverted mass go? Right? So in the open feed water heater, the diverted mass is separated between the two turbines and goes into the feed water heater. In a closed regenerative system, right? Now, again, we're still, it, the diverted mass comes from in between these two turbines, but then it goes through one side of this closed feed water heater and comes back together in the condenser. So what about the undiverted mass? Right? We talked about this already in the open feed water heater. So the undiverted mass goes through the second turbine, through the condenser, through this first pump, and then everything comes back together inside the open feed water heater. But with a closed feed water heater system, right, this undiverted mass only goes through the second turbine and then everything comes back together in the condenser. So what about all the mass? Right, so all the mass, the total mass flow rate, or the textbook sometimes will call this the mass flow rate flowing through the steam generator, right, or the boiler, because the total mass flow rate always goes through the boiler in both of these cases, right? So here in the closed feed water heater, we come out the exit of the condenser through this pump. There's only one pump here. Then here through the closed feed water heater, the other side of it through the steam generator and then back through the first turbine. For the open feed water heater, we come out the feed water heater and then we come through and go through here. Now, you can see that the, there's, you know, maybe you can foresee the problem here, right? For all the other Rankine cycles we've talked about so far, we've been able to say that all the components, at least on the inside of the Rankine cycle, are one inlet and one outlet. And that's not true anymore for the Rankine cycle. And that's what may, or the regeneration cycle. And that's what makes the rank and regeneration difficult, right? Is because here, this open feed water heater has two inlets and one outlet, right? And here, the condenser also has two inlets and one outlet. So that means that not all the mass flow rates are the same. So we have to have some kind of an accounting for what the mass flow rates are. So first, I'm gonna take you through the open feed water heater We'll talk about how to account for the mass flow rate and then how to get an equation for thermal efficiency. Because I really think that usually if we can find an equation for thermal efficiency, then that means we sort of know how to deal with the cycle. Right? So remember, 
Our thermal efficiency is going to be the energy benefit, that's the net power, divided by the energy cost, which is the heat we're putting into the system. All right, so here I'm going to look at this and say, okay, what's producing power? Here I have two turbines, consuming power, two pumps, and adding heat just one place in the steam generator. All right? So before I start to use the first law to sort of look at equations for the W dots and the Q dots, I got to figure out what's going on with the mass flow rate. So again, this is why I like taking a colored pencil or a marker or something, and I look at what the cycle looks like, right? And I know anywhere on the red line, right, then that's the diverted mass. Anywhere on the blue line, that's the undiverted mass. Anywhere on the purple line, that's the total mass flow rate. So I like to go component by component, and sometimes the component will have only one mass flow rate associated with it. But then if I have a component where there's more than one inlet or more than one outlet, then there'll be more than one mass flow rate associated with it. So then we got to look individually at the inlet and outlet ports. So first, I look for my purple line. This is the total mass flow rate. And I look for components where my purple line goes through the whole thing. Right, so it starts at the inlet, goes to the outlet. Right, so anything that's one inlet and one outlet on my purple line gets the total mass flow rate. So here in my column here in my table, I have the mass flow rate that we're talking about divided by the total mass flow rate. The total mass flow rate is the mass flow rate through the steam generator. That's the mass flow rate associated with this purple line. So this is like 100% of the mass flow rate goes through the steam generator goes through the second pump, goes through the boiler, and through the high pressure turbine, right? I think I said steam generator and boiler, but they're the same thing in this case. Next, I'm going to look at the components that are also one inlet and one outlet, but that get the undiverted mass flow rate, right? So if Y was 20% of the mass flow rate, this would be 80% of the mass flow rate. So this is always going to be the majority of the mass flow. So this goes through the second turbine, right? So the low pressure turbine, the condenser is one inlet and one outlet, and the first pump is one inlet and one outlet. So those are the straightforward ones, right? The ones that were one inlet and one outlet that have one mass flow rate associated with them. Now I got to think about the feed water heater, right? So the feed water heater has two inlets, one coming in at state five, one coming in at state two, and one outlet that's going out at state six. Now again, I like to take the time to do the colored pencil thing because that lets me see, hopefully pretty easily, what's going on here at the feed water heater. So at state five, right, I got a blue line coming in here. So that's the undiverted mass flow rate, 80% if this Y is 20%, okay? The other inlet comes in at state two, and it's the diverted mass flow rate, or 20% in our sort of hypothetical example here. And then the outlet, that's all of the mass flow rate, because this is the component where everything comes back together. Right, so this feed water heater is going to be um, a little bit trickier, right, because there's more than one mass flow rate. Now, the good news is um, these systems are often the ones that unlock the whole cycle. Because oftentimes, you know, you don't know what Y is. So in the problem, it's going to ask you to find Y. The answer to how to find Y is often, but not always, do the first law on the system that has more than one inlet and more than one outlet. Right? So now I want to go back to my thermal efficiency equation. Right? So I know that in my numerator, I have net power. And we talked about for reheat, instead of just being the turbine power plus the pump power, which is what you'll do tomorrow for our four component rank, rank and cycle, it's actually the sum of all the turbine powers plus the sum of all the pump powers. Remember that because I'm adding these up, I have to get these equations from the first law so that turbine power is positive and pump power is negative. These things, if I can make the assumptions that I usually make, are going to be m dot times h in minus h out. So first I have to identify all the turbines. That's where power is being produced. And I have to identify all the pumps. That's where power is being consumed. So here I can see in this particular cycle, I have two turbines and two pumps. 
So my net power term has four different components in it or four different terms in it. So I have to do the first law on all four of these components. Thankfully, the analysis is going to be the same for all of these, right? But if I want an equation for my net power, it's going to be power from the first turbine plus power from the second turbine plus power from the first pump, which is negative, plus power from the second pump, which is also negative. So if I look at these things, and I won't write it out this time, right? But the assumptions that I'm making here are that these components are steady state. They're all one inlet and one outlet. I'm neglecting kinetic and potential energy for all of these components. And I'm assuming that they're adiabatic. And if that's the case, then I'm going to get the equation that hopefully I know and love at this point, where it's m dot times h in minus h out. It's okay if you don't love it, right? But you should at least know, right? Or at least know what you're expecting from the order of the enthalpy terms when you're talking about a turbine or a pump. I think you should love it, right? So now, this is the difference, right? This is the thing that makes this part tricky, right? So for all the other cycles we've talked about, at this point, we said, oh, we can just divide by the mass flow rate because the mass flow rate is constant everywhere. But that's not true in these regenerative cycles because the mass flow rates are different. Right? So now in that previous table that I made, right, I go back and say, oh, the, the first turbine, well, that was the whole mass flow rate. Right? The second turbine, oh, that was the undiverted mass flow rate, right? our 80%. Same with the first pump. And then the second pump, oh, that was after all the fluid came back together. So that's the total mass flow rate. Right? So why do we do this? Right? We like to get everything as a percentage of the total mass flow rate because ultimately in our thermal efficiency, we're still going to have net power over heat transfer in. And if we can factor the total mass flow rate out of everything, we can still cancel the mass flow rate, the total mass flow rate from the numerator and the denominator. Right? But it's important that um, you know, these things won't all contribute equally based on their delta H because the mass flow rate is different. Right? So we got to keep track of that. That's kind of what makes these regenerative cycles different. So here I could talk about, and the, the textbook says this, instead of calling this like specific power or something, they'll talk about the power per kilogram of steam flowing out of the steam generator or something like that, right? What that means is the net power divided by the mass flow rate or the total mass flow rate or the mass flow rate through the steam generator, right? So when we do that, then our M dot terms, we can still factor out m dot from all four of these terms and divide both sides by m dot and we go from big w dot down to little w dot. And now instead of having an equation that's only h's, we have an equation that's h's but also has y in it. Right? So now well, that's the numerator, right? So now we talk about oh where are we adding heat? Right? And unlike the reheat cycle, here there's only one place where we're adding heat. So we can do the first law analysis. We'll say that it's steady state, that it's passive, so that W dot term goes away, that it's one inlet and one outlet, that there's no kinetic energy change, no potential energy change, and I get M dot times H out minus H in. H out is state one, H in is state seven, and the mass flow rate through the boiler is the total mass flow rate. Right, so this is just gonna be M dot times H one minus H seven. Right? Or, again, I can take the specific heat transfer rate, divide by the total mass flow rate, and just get delta H. Notice that Y doesn't show up here in our denominator because here all the mass flow goes through this steam generator. So if I had an open feed water heater that looked exactly like this one, then this is the equation that I would get for my thermal efficiency. Here's where things can get tricky because how do I find the H's, right? I ask what's the fluid and because the fluid is water, then I say, oh, is it, um, is it a subcooled liquid or is it a two-phase mixture or is it a superheated vapor, right? That's the same thing you're going to be doing on the exam tomorrow, right? So hopefully that's starting to become, um, you know, more clear to you. You're starting to get a better perception of this. The new part here is how the heck do we find Y? Right? And there's three different ways we can find Y. Right? 
So first, maybe they tell us what the net power of the cycle is. If we knew the net power of the cycle, right, then I know that big W dot is equal to M dot times all of this stuff on the top. So if I knew the net power and I divided by all this, you know, this function of H's and Y's, then I would get the mass flow rate. I think more likely what often happens, if you get lost on one of these problems, do a first law analysis on the feed water heater, because even if it's not the thing that you're going to need to do for the part that you're lost on, you're definitely going to have to do a first law analysis on the feed water heater in one of these problems. So that's a place. So if one of the ways we can find, so there's only a couple ways to find mass flow rates in this class, right? So first, we know that the mass flow rate is the area times the velocity divided by the specific volume. That's the same thing as the volumetric flow rate divided by the specific volume. Next, we can use the first law, right? But, oh, that's great. Yeah, use the first law. It's thermodynamics, right? So there's a couple ways we can use the first law, right? The first is we look for some place where they tell us a power or a heat transfer rate. Because then I can do the first law and I can get some equation like this. That's a function of H's or Y's and M dot and this power term or this heat transfer rate, right? So then I can isolate for Y. In this case, I can't use the heat transfer rate to find Y because Y doesn't show up in the heat transfer rate, right? But the third thing I can do to find mass flow rates is I can try to do a first law analysis on some component that has more than one inlet and more than one outlet. Right? Because that will give me some equation that's, you know, usually when I do that, I'm going to say that it's adiabatic and passive. So I'm going to get an expression that's only, in this case, Y's and H's. Or generally something that's about a mass flow rate, right? Like Y times M dot and enthalpy. So if I could fix the states, then I could know something about the mass flow rates. Right? So generally with regeneration cycles, if I'm trying to find Y, I look for, did the problem tell me something about the power, the total power generated or the power generated from one turbine or something? Or I try to do a first law analysis on the open feed water heater, right? Or the closed feed water heater if it's that, but we'll see that soon, right? So if I do a first law analysis on the feed water heater, what does that look like, right? So here's the feed water heater, right? I'm gonna say that we're at steady state. I'm also gonna say that we're adiabatic. Heat is being transferred inside of this component, but that heat, you know, if I drew a squiggly arrow, right, it would be heat going from this mass that comes in at state two to this mass that comes in at state five, and that squiggly arrow never crosses my control volume. So I'm going to say that this is well insulated, that there's no heat loss from this component. There's no fan blades in here, so I'm gonna say that it's passive. I'm gonna neglect kinetic and potential energies and I'm going to get the sum of m dot in h in is equal to the sum of m dot out h out. Here I have two inlets and one outlet, right? So I know that I have y times m dot coming in here at state two. And I have one minus y times m dot coming in here at state five. So my m dot in h in terms are going to be, if I factor out the total mass, y times h two plus one minus y times h5. And then coming out, I have the total mass flow rate, m dot, times h6. I might not even know the total mass flow rate, but that doesn't really matter because I can factor the total mass flow rate out of both sides of this equation, right? And then I could isolate for y, right? So here I would get, uh, you know, well, I won't do the math in my head, but you could see that you'll get an H5 term that comes over here and you'll have, you'll have delta H over delta H ultimately is equal to Y, right? But you gotta do it a little arithmetic to figure out what that answer is. So that's how we deal with open feed water heaters, right? So basically with all these Rankine cycles, we wanna know how do I do the net power? How do I do the heat in? How do I find Y, right? So we'll do the same thing with the closed feed water heater. Right? It's still a Rankine cycle, which means it's still a heat engine and it's still using water as the working fluid. Right? So I still want to find the net power and the heat transfer rate in. But I've still got this separation of the mass thing going on. 
so it's kind of a pain, right? So here, what do I do, right? So I got to separate the mass after my, you know, after my first turbine, right? And then that's the diverted mass flow rate. And I have the undiverted mass flow rate here, and I have the total mass flow rate. The thing about these closed feed water heaters is there's going to be two different components that have more than one inlet and more than one outlet, right? There's the condenser where everything comes back together. And then there's this closed feed water heater, which has a hot side and a cold side. So first, I'm going to look at the condenser. Oh, I guess maybe not. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm going to look, I'm going to identify the two, uh, the two components that are going to be problematic, right? The ones that are going to be more difficult because they have more than one inlet and more than one outlet. Then I'm going to go through the easy ones, right? So the gimmies, right? The ones that are easier are the ones where it's steady state, one inlet and one outlet, right? So here, these are the ones that um, have the whole mass flow rate going through them, right? So this is the pump. It's got one inlet, one outlet. The steam generator, one inlet, one outlet, purple line, right? So that's the total mass flow rate. And this first turbine, one inlet, one outlet, right? I've also got the low pressure turbine that's one inlet and one outlet. It has a blue line going through the whole thing, right? So that's one minus Y times the mass flow rate. But that's all the ones that are one inlet and one outlet um, at steady state, right? So now I got to start to look at the other ones, right? So if I look here at the condenser, I have this inlet, you can't see it here, but this is state three. So that's one minus Y times the mass flow rate. I have another inlet here at state four that's at Y times the mass flow rate, right? 20% was what we were talking about before. And then I get the total mass flow rate coming out the end. <coughs> On the cold side of the mass flow, uh, uh, so for this close feed water heater, there's two sides, right? And because we don't allow the mass flow rate to mix. That means the inlet and the outlet on the cold side have the same mass flow rate as the inlet and the outlet on the hot side. So states five and six have the same mass flow rate. That's the total mass flow rate. And states two and seven also have the same mass flow rate, which is the diverted mass flow rate. So this is our mass flow rate table for these components. Notice again that we're not doing this by state because a lot of these states show up more than once, right? So state two shows up more than once, state three shows up more than once, state four shows up more than once, right? State five, right? And sometimes they show up with different mass flow rates, particularly at state two. So the next thing we do is again, we talk about, well, what does our net power look like? So I identify where are the pumps in the turbine. So here there's two turbines that are producing power and one pump that's consuming power. So again, I know that this is going to be the sum of all these powers, letting the first law deal with the signs for me. So the pump is going to be a negative power. Right, so if all these things are steady state, adiabatic, one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic and potential energy changes, then I'm going to get M dot times H in minus H out. But I got to recognize that the mass flow rate in each of the turbines and the pumps could be different. So I got to go back to my table and I see that all the mass flow goes through the first turbine, the undiverted mass flow rate goes through the second turbine, and then the total mass flow rate goes through the only pump. So again, I could write a specific mass flow rate or, or a specific net power or a net power per kilogram or pound of mass flowing through the steam generator. Right? And then I get an expression that's only H's and Y's, right? So I got to factor out that total mass flow rate, just like I did with the open feed water heater. When I'm looking at the heat that goes in, again, there's only one place where heat goes in, right? So here, you know, this is going to be M dot times H out minus H in. If we say that it's steady state, passive, one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic energy change and no potential energy change. So this is M dot times H out minus H. Right, and that mass flow rate through the boiler or the steam generator is the total mass flow rate. Again, I can divide by the mass flow rate just to get an expression as a function of the enthalpies. So again, here I can uh, I can get an expression for my thermal efficiency. Again, because both the numerator and the denominator 
I can factor out the total mass flow rate, then this is only a function of the enthalpies and y. But again, we kind of get this question of how do I find y? Right, so again, if they told us the net power, so my net power expression has a y in it. So if I knew the net power, then I could do that. Again, I could do the first law analysis on a feed water heater. So that's a component with more than one inlet and more than one outlet. Or maybe I could do the mass flow rates on the condenser, um, or I could do a first law analysis on the condenser if I knew maybe the total heat that was rejected from, from the condenser into whatever cooling water happened, right? So if I knew that, then I could do that there as well, right? So if I know what's going on in the condenser. So this definitely works for the cold feed water heater. For the condenser, I should maybe update this slide because this assumes if you get to this equation that you're canceling out the heat lost. So you'd need to know cooling water coming in and cooling water going out. So then this would have three inlets and two outlets to do that. But if we did this on the feed water heater, then we get this expression. I have two inlets, right? One inlet's coming in at Y times the mass flow rate at state two. One inlet is coming in at the total mass flow rate at state five. And I have two outlets because this hot flow doesn't mix with the cold flow. The mass flow rate at state seven is also Y times the total mass flow rate. And the mass flow rate at state six is also the total mass flow rate. So here again, I could uh, divide both sides by the total mass flow rate, collect like terms so that I have a Y on one side, factor that out, and I'll get Y is equal to delta H over delta H, right? If I was going to do a first law analysis on the condenser, the heat transfer term is gonna stick around or I'm gonna have one more inlet and one more outlet, right? But if I know how much heat is being rejected from the condenser, then, I can look at this and I have two inlets, one coming in at state three, one coming in at state four, and one outlet, all of this, all of the, oh, the inlets are state three and state eight. I'm sorry, I got confused by the numbering there. And then the outlet, this should be state four at the outlet. Right, so I can do the first law there too, and if I knew the heat rejected, then I could find one. Um, I don't think we really have time to go through. Well, we'll go through this on the slides anyway. So here, this is a case for a closed feed water system. They tell us the power generated per mass flowing through the steam generator, right? Or little w dot net. And here, this might go reasonably quickly because we have all these values of y, right? So we're asked to find the diverted mass flow, and what is H at state six? So how do we fix state six? State six is the exit of the closed feed water heat. The other thing that I didn't talk about here, so as we move from state seven to state eight, right, we go through this trap. This is a, a valve, right? Nothing exciting happens in this valve. What happens is the pressure drops, but the enthalpy stays the same. So this is steady state, adiabatic, passive, one inlet, one outlet, no kinetic and potential energy changes, right? So what's gonna happen is uh, M dot H in is equal to M dot H out. And because the mass flow rates are the same, uh, the H's are the same too, right? So here, how do we find the mass diverted, right? So there's a couple options that we've had, right? So here we can say, oh, is, do we know the net power? Because if we know the net power, then maybe I can get an expression for Y, right? Do I know the states of all the, uh, at the feed water heater? I can't use this because I don't know state six. So if I did a first law analysis here, I would have Y as an unknown and six as an unknown, H six as an unknown. If you do that on a test, leave it, don't scratch it out because you're gonna have to do it later. Right, we're gonna see we're gonna do that in part B. Here, if I knew how much heat was rejected, I could also do a first law analysis on the condenser, but I don't know how much heat is rejected. So I can definitely cross out state three or option three here. 
And because I know the power, I'm going to do option one here. And then I can see that if I did option two, I'd have two unknowns. But I'm going to find one of those unknowns after I do part A. Right? So here, because we know the net power, we're going to use that option. Right? So the net power, there's two turbines and one pump. I'm going to assume that they're all steady state, adiabatic, one inlet, one outlet, no potential energy change, no kinetic energy change. So we get the expressions that we expect where W dot is equal to M dot times H in minus H out. Right? So then when I do that, I can get this. So I would have M dot, I'd have big W dot here and M dot times all of these terms. But I don't know big W dot, right? I know little W dot. So I divide both sides by m dot, which is good because I don't know the total mass flow rate. So it's nice that it falls out of my equation here. And then I, I fixed, or at least the, the problem told me all of these values of enthalpies, right? So then I can go through with this equation, isolate for y, or probably if I was going to do this, I would isolate for one minus y because it'll make the equation less messy, right? So maybe I solve and I get 80%, and then I know that y is just 20%, right? So here, in this problem, if you use all those numbers, then you'd find that y is equal to um, almost a quarter of the mass flow rate, or 0.23, right? You can go through if you'd like to do the numerical calculations yourself. But again, even on the exam, it's more about the process that you're following. So make sure when you're writing stuff on the exam, Put as much detail as you can. Because my job when I'm evaluating an, an exam is not, um, you know, did the student get the right answer? It's, did the student demonstrate that they have an understanding of the material that we're teaching? Right? So if you didn't write anything down and you just wrote down 0.23, I don't know if you just <laughs> were extremely lucky or if you know what you're doing. Right? So you want to put as much detail in your solution as you can. Again, I like to start with the base level of the equations, write down all my assumptions, cancel terms out, you know, derive these intermediate equations, and then only put numbers in at the end, show units in my calculations, and get to what I hope is the right answer. But even if it's not the right answer on the test, I've demonstrated the right process, which is what the majority of the, of the grade is about. Right now, the next part says, what do we do with state six? Right, so state six, you could look at this and say, man, I have no idea what to do, right? Or maybe you tried to do a first law analysis on the closed feed water heater for um, part A to find Y, and you found that you didn't know Y or H6. But here, if we do a first law analysis on the closed feed water heater, and we assume that it's steady state, adiabatic, passive, and we're gonna neglect kinetic and potential energy changes, then we'll get sum of the m dot in h in is equal to the sum of m dot out h out, right? So here I have two inlets, right? One's coming in at state two, one's coming in at state five, right? And two outlets, one's coming out at state seven and one's going out at state six. Now, if I did this first, I would say, oh, this is, well, first I'd say, oh, it's good. I can cancel out the mass flow rates, right? But then I would see this and I could say, oh, this is not so good because I don't know why, right? And I don't know H6. I would not scribble that out or erase it, or I guess because this is a digital exam, I wouldn't take that piece of paper, throw it in the garbage and not upload it. Upload all the work that you do because then I can look through it. And if I can help you out and give you some points because you demonstrated something, then I'll do that, right? So give me all of the work that you do Right? But here I can see that there were two things that I didn't know immediately. Right, I didn't know H6 and I didn't know Y. So this would not have been a good strategy right away to find Y. But then because I knew the net power, I found Y that way. And then because I found Y that way, I could plug it into this equation. Now I know H5, H2, H7. I found Y and the only thing I don't know was H6. So then, um, you know, there is a numerical answer for this. Although, again, I'm not sure how super helpful that is when we don't go through the calculations ourselves. But um, at least here you see the structure, hopefully, for how to answer a problem like this. Right? So look at the 
thing that they ask. And we try to ask, when we write a test, I try to ask the parts in a logical order, right? So, you know, just try to follow the process, right? Um, and again, tomorrow, so as you're studying, bring me your questions tomorrow in our class time. And uh, so I won't have anything prepared. Um, just bring your questions and I'll do my very best to answer everything that I can. If there are no questions, uh, that's all that I have for you, but I will stick around for a couple minutes in case there are questions. Thanks, everyone.